This week, we'll be discussing discrimination in civil rights in the United States. It's helpful to start with some basic definitions. When we think about the word prejudice, prejudice is having a belief or an attitude towards a certain group that is negative. Discrimination is when we act upon our prejudices. So discrimination is treating people differently because of their group identity. Oppression takes that a step further. and It's widespread or systemic discrimination that leads to institutional racism or institutional differences. So as a result of discrimination, we're seeing vast disparities in group because those discrimination ideas have become so ingrained in society. So these are basic definitions to keep in mind as we walk through this week's material. The first thing to, to address is why does discrimination occur? And there's three theories on why we have discriminatory behaviors um, and why those prejudices turn into discrimination. Um, the first and probably the, the largest is the idea of power, that one group is trying to gain economic power over another. And we see this, we've seen this with slavery. So when um, African-Americans were enslaved in the United States for so long, it was for ec really economic reasons that we needed free labor and we, we kind of, and we justified enslaving them for other reasons. But the core reason we enslaved them was for economic reasons. Um, we also see these with discriminatory behaviors towards immigrants that people, some people view that immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans. So we act discriminatory towards them to maintain that economic power or to maintain those jobs. Um, there's also this frustration hypothesis where if people are upset or angry, they need a scapegoat. They need someone to direct their aggression. Um, and they seek out substitute targets. So we definitely saw this um, with Jews during World War One in World from the transition between World War One to World War Two. That you know Germany was in really an economic decline following World War One, um, and Hitler rose to power to, on this idea that he can bring back the German economy, and he did it through discriminatory behaviors towards Jews in particular and other groups. Um, so we need a target for our um, for our ideas, for our frustration. Um, we also have this third theory of using morality to justify discrimination. Um, so a lot of times our religious be beliefs can be used to justify discrimination. So they have pulled, individuals have pulled um, certain Bible quotes to justify, you know, the, the, sin of the sin of homosexuality, to justify inferiority of women. Um, they, there's Bible passages that justify separation of races, that God created different races to keep them separate. So that kind of justifies separate, but equal. Um, so there's a variety of religious beliefs that have been used. And what we kind of see is, again, if, if we think of power, this economic power as the dominant theory on why discrimination occurs, we're using these religious beliefs. We're using our frustration to justify our discriminatory behaviors when really it, a lot of times the core reason is for economic advantages. So because of these discriminatory beliefs, um, the U.S. has a, a long history of discrimination um, against a variety of groups. Uh, it's really any group that's not white has been discriminated against. Um, so we saw this Mo, you know, just within the past hundred years um, with Jim Crow laws when we had enforced segregation, separate but equal, um, limited voting rights for minority groups. Um, so over time, despite the fact that African-American men received the right to vote uh, following the end of the Civil War, um, they weren't really able to vote and African-American women weren't able to vote until women received the right to vote. Um, so to prevent African-American men from voting in the 1800s, um, they had literacy tests, they had polling taxes, land requirements. They had a lot of places that had what's called the grandfather clause that um, you could vote if your grandfathers were able to vote, which when African-Americans received the right to vote in following the Civil War, their grandfathers were slaves, so they weren't able to vote. Um, so these were around for, for a, over 100 years that they implemented these to prevent minority groups from voting. Um, Native Americans didn't receive the right to vote until the 1920s um, after they fought in 
the Civil War, after they fought in World War I. Um, so there are a variety of laws limited the rights of Native Americans. Um, they didn't become citizens until the 1920s. They were removed from their land and pushed away for economic reasons that, you know, white Americans wanted land that Native Americans were on, and they justified moving them with this idea of inferiority. Um, we had a variety of Asian exclusion acts in the early 1900s. It wasn't really until the 1960s that Asians were fully able to immigrate to the United States. Um, it was, or it was much harder for them to immigrate up until the mid 1960s. Um, so we had the Chinese exclusion act in the late 1800s, early 1900s, which essentially made it that a Chinese could not immigrate to the United States. If they were in the United States already, they had to wear, they had to carry documentation with them around constantly. Um, does that remind you of how the Jews were treated in World War II? So yeah, the U.S. has some really bad um, discriminatory behaviors that, you know, sometimes we might think that we're better than other countries, but we've had the same history as some countries that we've really, um, have always historically kind of viewed as, as not as good as America. Um, this, if to understand kind of where are we today, um, this figure is from just a few years ago, I believe it's from 2018. Uh, Americans were asked, were surveyed, do you think discrimination occurs based on your group? Um, and you can see the different percents that of the group. So 55% of whites who were surveyed believe that whites are discriminated against. 92% um, of African Americans believe that their group is discriminated against. And you can see the other numbers. Um, the one thing, one takeaway from this is number one is that all groups feel that they are discriminated against. So almost every single group on here, over half believe that they are discriminated against. Men is 44%, so that's a little less than half. Um, the highest groups that believe they are discriminated against would be Black Americans at 92%, and then LGBTQ individuals at 90%. So 90% of LGBTQ individuals feel that their group is discriminated against. So there really is, continues to be widespread discrimination in the United States. Um, and if you look further at this report that was released, um, what kind of else came about is that the number one area where people feel discriminated against is in the workplace. So specifically with regards to hiring, getting job interviews, um, equal pay and promotion. Um, and one striking piece of research that came out is just looking at um, the influence of your name on getting a call back for a job interview. So they did research, they submitted 5,000 job applications and they used, they, all they did was change the name on it. So the, the information on the resume was the exact same other than the name. And they used historically white names and historically African American names. Um, and what they found is that individuals with white sounding names or historically white names were significantly more likely to get callbacks on job resumes um, than individuals with historical African-American sounding names. Um, and it was for whites, in order to get a callback on a resume, they had to submit 10 resumes. Um, and for African-Americans, they had to submit 15 resumes. So African-Americans, so essentially it's a 50% difference in that um, to get callbacks. So we see really widespread discrimination in the workplace, when it comes to schooling, housing, there's a variety of ways that individuals are still being discriminated against. And we have a video that you're going to be watching that discusses that in a little more detail. So there have been different efforts to reduce discrimination, um, specifically different laws that have been enacted. Um, the one that individuals are probably the most uh, familiar with would be the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this actually put into law that you cannot discriminate against certain groups. Um, and the groups, they're called protected classes. So you cannot discriminate against individuals um, based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Um, that's the original Civil Rights Act. Um, and subsequent uh, laws have also made it discriminatory to uh, discriminate based on age, disability status, and veteran status. So those are the federal classes. Um, different states have extended that to, all, to different groups. But federal law makes it so that you cannot make decisions based on those groups in particular. Um, the other 
law that came into place was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, so prior to 1965, as I mentioned, we had a lot of discriminatory voting laws. Um, so again, we had polling taxes, land requirements, literacy tests. These were all things that were directed towards certain groups to prevent them from voting. Um, so the Voting Rights Act of 1965 eliminated those obviously discriminatory voting laws. Um, that does not mean that we still don't have discriminatory voting laws today. They are just uh, less apparent in how racist they are. Um, so you will be watching a video on how certain voting laws do disproportionately impact certain groups. Um, there's also Title IX of the Education Amendments in 1972. Um, so a lot of college students might just be familiar with this as Title IX. Um, and you're probably familiar with this in, with regards to um, sports. So Title IX, one of its requirements is that schools have to spend equal amounts of money on programs for both males and females. So this is a lot of individuals kind of see this as making sure that women's sports and male sports both have the same amount of money funneled towards them. But it does a lot more than that. It also has a variety of stipulations for uh, requirements that schools have to go through with regards to sexual assault and harassment. Um, so there's a lot of Title IX stipulations to protect individuals for those reasons. Um, there's also the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Um, so this makes it, provides, um, made it, you cannot discriminate based on disability status. It also makes it so that certain buildings have to be ADA accessible. Certain places of employment have to provide reasonable accommodations. Um, for individuals with disabilities. Uh, there's also hate crimes legislation. So this is makes it so that if an individual commits a crime and the crime, the reason for the crime is um, that someone is part of a protected class, they would receive additional, additional penalties. So let's say an individual, um, you know, assault someone because of their gender or because of their race um, or because of their sexual orientation, um, that individual who committed the crime would receive a, a larger sentence than someone who might have done that exact same crime, but not for to target that group in particular. Um, the things to keep in mind is when we look at these policies to reduce discrimination, um, there are certain groups that aren't protected. Discrimination still occurs definitely still occurs um, and it's legal towards specific groups. So there's a lot of groups out there. I'm not going to name all of them, um, but people with felony convictions are still discriminated against. So if, if you have a felony conviction and you're applying for a job, applying, trying to get housing, um, if you disclose that felony conviction, uh, you, they, that, that landlord, that employer cannot give you that position because you have a felony conviction. That is completely legal. It doesn't mean that it's right. There's a big difference between what's right and what's legal, but it is legal to discriminate against someone because of their um, felony status. Uh, you know, documentation status. So although you cannot discriminate some, against someone because of their national origin, that is illegal, you can discriminate against people because of their documentation status. Um, so if someone is in the country illegally and they're undocumented, um, they can be denied a job, they can be denied housing, they can be denied access to college. Um, some states actually make it, I, I believe it's Georgia. Georgia has a law where um, you cannot attend a public university in Georgia if you do not have, if you are not here legally, um, if you are not documented. So you have to provide a social security number or um, another, number saying that you're here legally um, in order to enroll in education. Um, so just things to keep in mind that we still have ways to go um, to prevent, really to eliminate discrimination. Um, so what things to keep in mind are how we can ensure that policies we make moving forward are anti-racist and anti-discriminatory. So when we think about a racist versus an anti-racist policy, these definitions are coming from um, Abram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, so it's a great book, I would highly recommend it. Um, but he really lays out that we have racist policies and we have anti-racist policies, that there's no neutral policy when it comes to race. Uh, and that's because a policy is either helping to make 
racial disparities worse or helping to make racial disparities better. So racist policies, any policy that maintains disparities between racial groups. So if we think about, um, you know, there's disparities in racial groups with regards to healthcare, education, income. Um, and if a policy makes it that the income gap is going to increase or the school test or education outcomes are going to increase as a result of that policy, it would be considered a racist policy. An anti-racist policy is one that reduces disparities between groups. Um, so and we're, you're gonna be doing a reading for class this week um, and it specifically ha uses um, FMLA as an example. So FMLA is the Family Medical Leave Act. So this is a policy, we'll talk more about FMLA later in the semester, but FMLA, just a quick background is what provides individuals with unpaid leave if they would need to take care of a new child or a family member. So it's up to 12 weeks. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is it's unpaid. So it's not paid and it is not guaranteed for everyone. So FMLA, you have to have worked at your place of employment for at least a year. You had to have um, worked so many hours a week. So you have to have been, I think it's like 20 hours a week that you've had to work there. Um, and it has to be at a large place of employment. So a lot of individuals don't have access to FMLA um, because they either are working part-time, they haven't worked there long enough, or they're working at a small place of employment. And FMLA disproportionately helps white Americans and Hispanics and African Americans have less access to FMLA. So we would actually consider that a racist policy because there's already these disparities between groups and it just makes those disparities even greater. Um, so it's just far greater for white Americans to access pay, unpaid time off, um, which helps them with income and maintain their jobs. Um, which disproportionately hurts African Americans and Hispanics. Um, but we see other racist policies, you know, when we think about the use of standardized test scores to measure achievement for, for school children, um, standardized test scores disproportionately favor white Americans while they disproportionately affect African Americans and Hispanics. Um, so we have to consider how the policy is written um, in order to decide, is this benefiting racial groups or is it hurting racial, those minority racial groups? Um, because we already have these widespread differences. So are we helping or are we hurting individuals who are already being marginalized? Um, so you're going to be listening to a podcast on how to be anti-racist in your everyday life. Um, and also some specific tactics that are used, uh, have been used by Black Lives Matter to make change, to make and facilitate change. Um, and that is all for this week. So enjoy the content.